All right, we've had a couple more people join us. Um, I think I'm going to get started um, so that we're not holding back people who have joined in already. So hello and welcome to our webinar on health and safety and working at height, where I will also introduce you to our partners, the Scaffolding Association, Work Screen and Safety Culture. My name is Trish Mayer and I've been working with SMAS, a sister company of the Citation Group, for over two years. As a partnership manager, I specialise in SSIP procurement requirements across all sectors to include construction and facilities management. If you should think of any questions during the presentation, feel, please feel free to uh, ask them in the chat box. And at the end of the presentations, we will go through the questions. Right, so we will be covering various aspects um, of working at height to <clears throat> include SSIP core criteria with SMAS WorkSafe. Um, Rob C Candy from the Scaffolding Association will look at the preparing and planning. Tom Pocker from WorkScreen um, will be covering hearing and working at height. And then last but not least, uh, safety culture will talk about monitoring and their training, sorry, their monitoring and training apps. Um, we'll just run through about who SMAS WorkSafe are. Um, we provide SSIP health and safety accreditation for both the private and the public sectors. We're a leading SSIP member scheme and um, we provide trusted health and safety accreditation to businesses across the UK. We're a health and safety assessment organisation and we take great pride in our professionalism our customer service and efficiency. And I think many of our customers, our clients and our members can attest to this. We work with major organizations across the UK and have developed expertise in construction, but we also deal with many other related industries such as manufacturing, engineering, agriculture, education and care. We also connect procurers with relevant businesses and we strive to ensure that clients can find businesses with the right accreditation for the jobs that they need to be completed. We have an in-house team of highly qualified assessors and our assessments and reviews are normally undertaken within three working days. Um, and that says a lot, that is a really good turnaround time in the industry. We also have very competitive pricing and are very much technology driven. Uh, we have da dashboards, um, three of them actually, the first being the member dashboard. And this is where our members would log in to begin their health and safety journey. Um, they can also do their PAS 91 on the dashboard, um, which will take them through all the different um, and relevant questions. We have a, a consultant dashboard as well, and this is to help the consulting companies who work on behalf of, of clients and our members as well um, to get things done and processed quickly and efficiently. And then lastly, we have a client portal. So our large key buyers and clients can log in to manage their supply chain as well as to source new suppliers. So we cover the standard health and safety assessment plus additional areas of compliance to include environmental quality and quality management, financial and business standing, anti-bribery and corruption, as well as modern slavery. The subject of working at height or falling from heights um, 
Falling from heights is actually by far the most common and dangerous risk when working in construction. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there are approximately 40 fatalities every year. Construction workers are often required to work from height, but the risks are increased dramatically when mobility is restricted or the correct training is not in place. It is important for site managers to make sure that anyone required to work from height has the correct training. So what I'm going to do, do is take you through some of the core criteria that we ask in the stage one health and safety assessment. Um, and then obviously, if you have any questions at the end, you can ask, feel free to ask. So what constitutes working at height? It means work in any place where if precautions were not taken, a person could fall a distance liable to cause personal in injury. And as an employee, um, most of the responsibility falls to you. So you must ensure that your workers are competent and that you adhere to all the health and safety regulations um, and that you assess and mitigate against risks. It's also your responsibility to provide the, and um, assess the safety equipment and to sure, ensure that it's all safe to use. Working at heart remains one of the biggest causes of fertility, fatality sorry, and major injuries. Common cases include falls from ladders and through fragile services. The organization is expected to have documented health and safety statement of intent to confirm the management's commitment to health and safety in the workplace. So <clears throat> the document also needs to be signed off and dated. The responsibilities and arrangements need to be included in the health and safety policy and what arrangements um, which are made and these arrangements need to be appropriate and applicable to the organization's activities and undertakings. You do have to have method statements in place and incorporate a safe system of works. Um, the document information provided in this question should reflect the organization's activities and the procedures that they implement to ensure the safety of their workforce and others when undertaking these activities. The completed method statement does need to be 12 months in date and reflect the activities of the organization. Um, it should also include your safe system of works, which describes supervision, training, emergency procedures, and all these things in place to ensure that the task will be concluded in a safe and controlled way. Performing risk assessments and safety inspections can help reduce risks associated with working at heights. And these regulations um, need to be adhered to. I think you know what I need to add is that there seems to be a lot of documentation involved, but once all of this is in place, um, it makes you feel more confident that you're working according to the law and the latest regulations. Um, and this is why the SSIP is only valid for one year and would then have to be renewed the following year. Right, working platforms um, used for construction work um, and working platforms um, is where basically a person could fall 
more than two meters. These need to be inspected after assembly in any position or after any event that is um, liable to have affected the stability. You know, it could be a weather issue, it could be any number of issues. Um, and then also at intervals which are not exceeding seven days. The competent person undertaking these um, monitoring activities they need to have the skills, experience, and knowledge to man manage the health and safety. Staff undertaking training must work under the supervision of somebody who is competent. You should implement training arrangements to ensure that all personnel have the relevant skills and understanding necessary to conduct their activities in a safe manner. And then also don't forget that once that training is completed, to have your continual refresher training. You can have a look at the requirements um, and just remember that all CACS details provided um, will always be cross-referenced with the ITB card checker. Senior persons responsible for health and safety um, must have the appropriate skills, knowledge and experience or have the expertise available to them, controlled to the address both trade and health and safety issues to ensure that tasks are managed and conducted in a safe manner. Um, there again, the examples of the evidence that we will require uh, to be uploaded um, to the dashboard is listed there. And once again, it will be cross-referenced. Um, very much the same for supervisory management, um, all details being cross-referenced once again. Directly employed and labor only subcontractors. Uh, personnel must have the appropriate health and safety qualifications and experience for the assigned tasks um, and all procedures must be in place to ensure that the workforce have the relevant training um, to undertake their work safely and without risks. Trade qualifications, you know, might vary and to include gas safe, um, city and guilds, et cetera, et cetera. And also the information once again will be cross-referenced. Very importantly is your accident incident reporting. Um, you must have in place your methods of rec reporting and of your, your um, accidents. Larger companies are expected to provide statistics of death, specific injuries, um, over seven day injuries, occupational diseases and dangerous occurrences from the last three years. Your riddle actions, the organization must keep accurate records regarding recent riddle reports together with the remedial actions taken to resolve the issue. You know, it's, it's no good reporting these incidents if remedial action is not being taken. Consultation and communication. Uh, the organization must have systems in place and um, our partner safety the culture will run through this very interestingly to tie into this section. Um, and this um, is really in the form of toolbox talks, um, you know, accompanied by signed uh, attendance sheets, records of health and safety meetings, health and safety memos um, provided to employees and your subcontractors. Um, 
it, or any documentation which must be dated within the last 12 months. All of this information as well is cross-referenced to the training matrix. Um, always good to have a look on the HSE website, which is hse.gov.uk. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but just as, as a refresher. So where SMAS WorkSafe can assist you, um, we have preferred supplier. So if you are new to health and safety or your company has um, not got your health and safety procedures and policies in place, etc., SMAS can give you the full suite to include environmental review, um, quality review, as well as action plans, you also have access to a helpline um, and tailored policies, which are provided by SMAS WorkSafe. And there again, we will also do a mid-year review. Uh, the WorkSafe Pro would include everything up until the ERCA quality review. And if you would just like to do the health and safety, the SSIP core criteria, the work safe assessment would tick your boxes. Should you go ahead with a SMAS uh, work safe accreditation, you will then be able to download your five key areas of risk summarized in one easy to access place. And these are very handy when completing tenders um, and completing the PQQ. So if you have done the full suite, you will have your health and safety core criteria accreditation, as well as other certificates to include environmental, quality, financial and business standing, anti-bribery and corruption and modern slavery. If you do opt to just go for the health and safety stage one, um, obviously that would be the only thing included. Um, contact details, should you wish um, to chat to us further, my details are there, as well as our um, technical manager, Ray Holder. What I'm now going to do is um, introduce the next speaker. I see Rob has dropped off, so I'm just going to pop him. There we go. There's Rob. Um, and Rob will be getting his presentation up. So to introduce Rob, um, he has many accolades to his name. Um, he has founded the Scaffolding Association in 2011 to raise the profile and professionalism of scaffolding within the construction industry. He's worked as a health and safety consultant, CDM coordinator and temporary works coordinator for a large range of clients, including multinational companies, local authorities and UK charities for over 15 years. He is a graduate member of IOSH and has a fellowship from the Royal Society of Public Health. He sits on the board of the Specialist Engineering Contractors Group, as well as Safety Schemes in Procurement. The Scaffolding Association is a non-for-profit non independent trade organization campaigning to raise the standards of safety, technical quality and workforce skills in the scaffolding sector. Membership of the association is an insurance of quality and demonstrates an ability to carry out the safe design, installation and commissioning. The association works with its members, client organizations, government agencies and standard setting bodies to ensure high standards of training and competence across the industry. It also protects standards through a competence-based, independently verified accreditation scheme in line with CDM Regulations 2015. Rob, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, everybody. Um, 
I'll introduce them, Robert Candy, Chief Executive of the Scaffolding Association. The Scaffolding Association is the largest trade body in the scaffolding and access sector. We've got over 500 member companies. We've got 530 as of today. Uh, we've got 100 audited contractors and over 350 SIP accredited contractors that are members. Uh, the membership categories are broken up. The majority of those 451 are contracting companies, but we've also got suppliers, service providers and scaffold designers. So that just gives you a breakup of, of the association and sort of the, the depth of knowledge that's available through it. We'll work on to uh, work at IT. What are the legal requirements um, under the work at IT regulations that, that we should be doing? You must make sure work is properly planned and supervised. The work must be carried out by competent people with the skills, knowledge and experience to do the job. And you must use the right type of equipment for working at height. So um, lots of people go on about regulation. The regulations are very clear in relation to work at height. Um, it's people's practical understanding of not going through the processes that are laid out in how uh, you undertake the planning and the choice or selection of staff or equipment. So on the next few slides, we're going to go through that and look at what that process might look like. So when we're looking at what kind of work we should be doing at heart, working at height, we've got to look at what the hierarchy of controls are. So it's, it's a little bit of a funny statement, but when you're working at height, the first thing you should be doing is avoiding work at height. And I think um, what a lot of people um, jump to is what's available, what can we use, how can we do it without even looking whether we should be doing it. And I think um, the one big failing of CDM is that we've still got architects and people designing buildings that are not easy to manage from a work at height perspective. And that should be that's a, an absolute requirement for a designer under CDM to make sure that in the future uh, they can uh, build, they can build buildings that that will either be maintained, adapted, or or demolished in a safe way. Uh, and I think we've got a lot of work to do with how um, we we look at work at height. Um, sometimes it's unavoidable, but a lot of the time it could have been. Um, undertaken in a different way if the building from its concept had been designed slightly differently. So that's that's the first route. How have we adapted that? Uh, many of you will have travelled around the UK and you'll see people lifting uh, framed timber framed roofs directly up onto the scap onto a brick built, brick built structure. So the the um, carpenters are actually building on the floor and then crane it up. We're doing exactly the same with scaffolding now where we've got temporary roofs or bridge units over the rail. We're actually building them and using it as a lifting operation to avoid people working at height. So that's what we should be doing is, what, how can we avoid people working at height? Or if we can't avoid people at height, how can we reduce the time that they will spend working at height? So where work at height cannot be avoided, so we've come to the conclusion that it's not practical, the work has to be done and there is no other way than people working at height to do it. What we should be doing is preventing falls using the existing place of work that is safe or the right type of equipment. So what, what we're looking at there is where if you've got um, a roof that has got a fully um, cladded parapet around it whereby you couldn't fall off the roof or if there are um, if you were installing something and you could work off of um, an existing external uh, gantry, parapet or um, a walkway, then that's something that you should be looking at rather than actually trying to use specialist equipment or other bits and pieces. So minimise the distance and consequences of the fall. So what we've looked at in the previous um, step is people working from somewhere where they cannot fall. So the next step is, if we've got a situation where somebody who is working at height can fall, how do we minimize the distance or the consequences of that fall? 
or using the right type of equipment where the risk can't be eliminated. So we've now actually said we've actually failed in relation to CDM and all the other things that we should have in place because we've now got to the stage where the level of risk that we're accepting is that we think somebody could fall. So when you're looking at all of these things, that's what, as a business owner, you're accepting when you get to the stage that you start looking at uh, minimizing the distance and consequences of court of the fall, you've now accepted the fact that somebody can fall. And I think the one thing to always remember with all of these things, we should be trying to, to look at planning so that we don't get to that stage. Once we get to that stage, you, you can minimize the distance and consequences of a fall, but even somebody tripping over could fall awkwardly and die. So there's never a, a, a sort of, this is this is a good option if somebody falls even into a safety net or or anything else we've had accidents with people falling into safe systems of work it doesn't mean they're not going to hurt themselves and particularly when you look at scaffolders because when you're looking at scaffolding if they do fall they're going to hit the scaffolding that they've just been erected on their way down or while their fall is arrested so we should be looking at how we get to that so there are various options for minimizing the distance and consequences, but again, you know, you've got to look at what other options are available higher up the hierarchy before you can do that. And when we're looking at any of these options, the last point here is to use measures that protect everyone at risk, which is called collective protection. So where you've got um, a safety net, that's collective protection because anybody can fall into it. When we go to PPE and harnesses, that's individual protection will only in affect or will only save the person that's wearing it. So when you're looking at any options, we should always be looking at what the collective um, is a better route to go down than individual protection. So when you look at that, when you look at this, it, it gives you each of the regulations, but looking at what those processes are. So avoiding work at height, preventing falls, existing workplace, Preventing falls through collective equipment. Scaffolding, once it's erected and handed over, is collective equipment. It's a safe place for people to work from. Preventing falls using PPE in a way that prevents a fall. So this is uh, where you look on the tops of roofs, you will have man-safe systems or where scaffolders use fixed lanyards. It means they can't get to an unprotected edge where they can fall. Uh, then you get to the stage where you're using fall arrest equipment where you're minimizing the distance using, um, sorry, you, you're minimizing uh, the distance that they can fall. Uh, minimizing conse consequences using collective equipment. Again, we still have accidents with people falling into safety nets, um, bean bags, things like this, specifically in construction. We've still got problems with that. Um, and then the last one is minimizing consequences through training and instruction. And uh, I would ask that if we get that far, then uh, we, we, we failed on the fact that the work at IREG said we should be planning the work. So what does that planning look like? Um, what we need to know is what does the site look like? Where is it? Is it on a seafront? Is it in a town? Is it somewhere where it's exposed? Um, what are we looking at? What client requirements are there? So that, has the client got requirements that, that we need to meet over protection of its own staff or protection of um, buildings? So, you know, for scaffolding, there are a lot of historic buildings where we can't tie the scaffolding or can't attach anchor points. So, you know, that has an effect on it. And what what is the actual location? So when you're looking at that, a lot of that information is before you've even sent people to the site, if possible. Um, I will just make a point on that of um, gathering information. A lot of people talk uh, specifically about work at IT and planning for work at IT, that it's an emergency call out. But if it's an emergency call out to an office block where you already know that the ceiling height is four meters and you're sending out somebody with, two, with a two meter step ladder, then you've just accepted the fact that he's going to stand on top of the steps. So when we're talking about information, a lot of this information is available, um, but not available if you don't ask for it and you just send people straight out to work, because that is unplanned. So 
selection and solution and task information. So we'll, we'll come on to the selection of, of equipment, but that planning, what, what are you using? What information are you giving to the people that are going to do the work? Because you've made a lot of decisions for them before you send them to work. So what is the safe system of work and what is the risk assessment around that work? Are they aware of it? Do, do, have they been trained in it? So there's, there's a lot of things there before when you're making that selection process of who you send to do that work. So the pre-start checks what conditions are required for these people to actually start the work. So as I said, having the right length of step ladder or the right type of equipment, having the right training. So all of that is important at that stage. What levels of supervision and competence do we require of people to do this? So we'll look at what that is, but there are specific um, pieces of equipment or types of work or types of structure that need to be built that pe need people with certain skill sets or certain qualifications to be able to do it. Who's going to monitor the controls that are in place? Um, so what about um, the weather? Who's going to say, right, it's now too windy to do this or, or the, the, the weather's changed? Um, and how do we manage that change? So what happens when you're working outside and, and all of a sudden the wind gets up to 30 or 40 mile an hour. What, what's in the safe system of work over the work that we're doing? So, you know, I've been to sites where people on uh, a Friday afternoon have loaded a roof up with roofing sheets, knowing that in the English weather, we're going to have storms over the weekend. So that's a, a poor selection of the planning of that work at height that should be carried on. So when we're looking at levels of supervision, it's a very simple graph. You know, the levels of competence and the levels of risk of the staff will determine the degree of supervision. So when you're looking at the, the risk involved with work at height, what you're looking at there is what's the complexity, duration, uh, how difficult is it, and what would be the level of competence of the people. So when you're looking at that, you can look at how often somebody would need to be supervised. But it's important that we do supervise people, even if it's periodic for experienced employees. When we look at competence, we've got skills, and these skills could be management, planning, supervisory, trade, equipment, inspection of um, worker height equipment or structures. Um, so specific to whatever task it is, any or all of those could be required by certain people. The knowledge that's required, uh, equipment limitations. We've got a lot of people um, over the past few years that there's been a lot of good moves in relation to mutes and things like that, where people not only have to have a ticket to say that they can operate one, but actually familiarization training on the specific equipment that they're using. But what is the industry guidance behind um, the work that we're doing and what does best practice look like so that we know what, what we should be doing? And the experience, have, have the staff that we're sending to do this work, have they undertaken similar types of work to this before or used the specific equipment that we're asking them to use? So when we're looking at competence, we should be looking at all of those things for the team that we're going to be sending out to do the work. So when we're looking at what work we're going to ask these people to do, these are the things that we need to work through to look at how we select what would be the best option of the equipment or the solution that we're going to use. So what is the height and the complexity of the task? How difficult is it to undertake? Will it will obviously affect levels of experience and levels of training. Um, height an interesting topic for a working at height thing. We've got a lot of scaffolders in the industry who are afraid of heights. Um, so, you know, people sort of look at that. There's a huge difference between somebody working below 10 metres, which is the same height as their bedroom window, and them not being frightened, and somebody going 50, 60 metres in the air. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's a big difference. Don't just think that because people have a job which says I can work at height, that they can work at any height. Um, what's the duration and the frequency of the work? Is it a, a quick job that, that, that we just need to do? 
um, because we've we've got a little bit of a fault, or is it something we've got to do on a regular basis? And this then goes back to CDM. Is there a way of uh, looking at putting this equipment somewhere that's more accessible if it's got to be frequently accessed, or what are the options there? Condition of the surface being worked on. Um, I've just uh, before we took this, I've just looked at an IOSH um, email that I've had come through about somebody in the port of Tilbury dying, falling through a fragile roof. And fragile roofs are something that through the planning stage, we know are there. We know what we should be doing with them, but we're still killing too many people falling through fragile roofs just through a lack of communication and information. So th that's the kind of thing that we've got to look at with the surfaces that we're being worked on and also what kind of weight limitations they would have. And it's quite interesting when you talk to people that, you know, we've got some some people that work within construction um, that, that, that could be up to 20 stones. And when you're looking at the weight limits, we should be checking weight limits on uh, rescue equipment, fall arrest equipment, everything else. Because by the time those guys have got overalls on, tools, all the other bits and pieces, then, you know, they might be outside the limits of some of the equipment that they've got. So we need to, when we're looking at weight weight limitations, it doesn't isn't just the weight limitation on a, a tower, a scaffold, or on something of how many guys and how much equipment, but can all the safety equipment take the weights that we're expecting it to do? I spoke about weather conditions. There are, there are, you know, we've got to be constantly aware in this country that the weather can change very, very quickly, and we should be looking at uh, processes. You don't need specialist equipment to know when the wind's getting up. You can look at trees, lots of other things. There's, there's some very good guidance in CITB, G700 about the Beaufort scale and looking at what the wind speeds are. You know, you don't need specialist equipment to be able to do that. But the same could be said if we were having people were working on scaffolding and there was thunder and lightning. So we should be planning and looking at what it is we can do. And we might need special equipment to link that or earth the structures. Um, provide protection from falling objects, whether it's members of the public or staff, wherever the work's being undertaken, we should be checking that we've got procedures in place to make sure that um, the work is either done from um, a place where we can demark a safe area where people shouldn't be going under underneath, or we should be looking at uh, protection fans or, or tool tethering or something to stop that from happening. Um, an interesting topic for me is emergency evacuation and rescue procedures. Um, a lot of people will go down cost-cutting measures of, of erecting scaffold with just ladder access. But what happens if a roofer uh, trips on the top of the scaffold over a roof tile and breaks his leg? How do we get him down if the only access route is down a ladder? Carrying somebody who's broken their leg down through a ladder or paramedics with all the kit they travel coming up is something that we should be thinking about. It isn't just about planning for the work at height. There are all the other trades sometimes, particularly with scaffolding, using that work. So how do we get people down if there's a fire, if there's an accident? How do we do that? And all of that we should be taking into account. And also, when we're looking at the solution, do we actually have the staff with the skills, knowledge and experience to do that? Because it might be we have to discount some solutions because we haven't got the equipment or the skills to be able to do it. So once you've been through that process, you're going to come up with uh, hopefully something that should have addressed most of the issues that you've got in relation to making the right choice over what it is we should be selecting. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Rob, for your presentation. It was very interesting, and I can see there's quite a few questions coming through, which we'll have at the end. Thank you. Right. I'm going to introduce you to our next speaker, Tom Parker. Let's get Tom up on the screen. He should be up any moment. Tom, are you there? Okay. Yep. While hi, Tom's. Hi. Oh, hi, Tom. Hi. Right. As an introduction, hi, yep. um, Tom is a quali an, an MBA qualified engineer, and he's been a key figure in the UK hearing and audiology industry since 2006, 
where he was managing director of a leading distributor, PC Worth. One way or the other, Tom's career has been about innovation and novel solutions. WorkScreen was created out of frustration that traditional hearing tests are not practicable for many organizations today. Our no contact testing is ideal for the new normal, especially with COVID. So Tom, it's over to you. Thanks, Trish. Just uh, killed my uh, my video because I think Brian is not my friend today. So I hope uh, I hope you can hear. Okay. Um, yeah, we can hear you. Thank so, you. So great. I, I guess uh, you may well be wondering um, what hearing's got to do with uh, health and safety and, and working at heights. But I, I think the key thing that I'd like to to bring in the next couple of minutes is. is we're only just beginning really to understand how hearing influences many, many different parts of our lives. And, you know, perhaps we should have realized it many, many years ago, but actually it's, it, it does touch on so much of what we do. And we're only just really believe, beginning to get into that. Um, and as Trish, as you said, we, we created the service that we offer so that, um, people can benefit from understanding this because it is so difficult or has been traditionally difficult to take care of your hearing in the workplace um, to the extent that people just haven't done it. Uh, and it is important in the world that we're talking about today. Some of the impacts um, can be things like uh, tinnitus, um, obviously hearing loss, um, dementia, which people may or may not be aware of. Uh, and that's obviously, you know, that's something that's looking into the future. But uh, you, you don't really want to be getting into that world if you can possibly avoid it. Fatigue and stress, obviously not never great uh, in construction uh, and balance, which I think is, is the one that I really wanted to touch on today and might be interesting for people to pick up on. If we're working at height, balance is, uh, is clearly an important thing. So I suspect many people on this webinar uh, either, um, you know, need or represent people who, who require testing in some in some form, because actually, you know, it, you know, our mission is that if you need testing, then our mission is that people who need testing should should be able to get it very very easily, uh, and that hasn't been easy until now. Um, so, you know, noise at work comes in in a few different forms. How it can how it can impact your health. There is a gradual damage with noise exposure. Typically, if you are exposed to a loud amount of noise the hse says it's about 85 decibels which is uh, typically if someone has to shout um for you to hear them um then then that's when it becomes um becomes relevant so things like ratchet guns or general building noise um would become become relevant there so it, continued exposure to that will damage your hearing point blank it is going to do that okay um on top of that you then have the potential of instant and permanent damage from extreme noise levels. And the little chart there on the top right, what that's trying to do is convey to you that if you can be exposed to loud noise for a period of time, because of the nature of the physics involved with, with noise, every three decibels of, uh, of 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 noise energy or, or, or loudness uh, half the amount of time that you get exposed to that noise safely which means that when we're getting to significant levels of noise of about 120 db plus you've really not got long before you're you're going to permanently damage your hearing and actually those uh, high levels of noise are easily generated in construction whether it is a scaff tube being dropped or whether it's something else going on on a building site or rivet guns or whatever it may be, or the guy next door or his drill, or however you, you are, um, or however you're exposed to noise, you know, loud noise is very, very damaging. And those traumatic fear is, uh, 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 those traumatic noises can permanently damage your hearing and often do so. So what you're gonna end up with or what you're potentially going to end up with there is with things like, uh, tinnitus uh, and, and hearing loss over a long period of time. And the important point there is not only the fact that hearing loss, you don't want it, 
tinnitus, you definitely don't want it. I suspect some people on this call got tinnitus of some description. But the fact that they contribute to things like fatigue and um, and the difficulty to communicate with your work colleagues and uh, listening. Isolation. And there's things to train like so, so the impact of something like five times more likely to miss work attendance work due to stress. It's never a thing. Um, perhaps more surprising is unidentified hearing loss is means you're five times as likely to develop dementia this is very recent research but uh, again this is real long-term health stuff and you do not want to be exposed to noise it is not a good thing uh, it is the leading um, uh, it is the leading industrial uh, um, operational health issue across Europe so and further to that, we have other matters which are just sort of highlighted there at the bottom that full sight are indeed the biggest killer as we, as we picked up before. And here if you're when micro perforations within uh, your ear hearing system mean that loud noises can actually generate loss of balance for a period of time. So, yeah, and this is stuff is pretty new. Uh, it is a little bit out there, but the point is that loud noise, whether it's an extreme loud noise, which may pose a very dramatic problem or risk to your health uh, and your, or your safety, and, um, and, and we need to see that. Whilst fall from heights are very um, are, are top issues, you know things like struck by a moving vehicle, struck by a moving object, uh, trapped by something collapsing is a delightful list, isn't it? Um, when you look at it, hearing it's your non it's your it's it's part of your defence kit. It's part of your personal defence kit. It's your only online of sight safety mechanism. And if you know that your colleagues can hear you to the best of their ability, then they are a warning risk to themselves and potentially to you too. Which is why, hopefully my slide will now turn. <laughs> Which is why the HSC, for some reason, I hope this is gonna come up now. Oh, uh, uh Tom, we seem to be having some. Can you see that? Is that up? I've got black screen. Tom, can you hear me? We seem to be having some technical issues with your sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, I can hear you uh, now. If you want to carry is that on. Better? How's that? Yes, that, that work? seems okay. to be better. Yes. Yeah, if it's. Uh, so really, this is why the HSE exists. There is a pathway, there's a law called the Noise at Work Act 2005. And a key part of that, if there's anything that I want you to remember from this slide, it's earmuffs are not enough, and that's the law. If you are exposed to noise or people who you work with or for you are exposed to noise, then you must provide hearing surveillance, which means essentially hearing tests to assure, ensure that their hearing is up to, is up to speed. And as part of that, obviously, you need to eliminate, reduce noise where you can in much the same sort of format as all the other health and safety mechanisms out there. Basically, there is a law. Then there are the guidelines on how to implement the law. Uh, then, of course, there are the penalties, which are increasingly upon um, on managers as well as uh, as well as organisations as well. But the key point there is really earmuffs are not enough and you need to. Uh, take steps to to check people's hearing. In terms of the options available to organisations, this is where WorkScreen came in, and we rather think that we're the Goldilocks of the industry, in the sense that you used to be able to uh, typically a truck would turn up on site, bottom left there, but you know having a truck turn up on site isn't always practicable, and when you've got a very mobile workforce. 
how do you make sure that you've got all the guys on site that you need to because there's a considerable expense in the truck turning up likewise if you go off site to a clinic um they will do a very good job i'm sure but you've got to get your, your guys off site at considerable expense to you and difficulty uh, you can do on-site audiometry which involves bringing someone who isn't necessarily au fait with uh, construct the world of construction onto your onto your building site onto construction site and they have very variable ways of implementing what actually is a very needs to be a very consistent and well controlled operation here to test your hearing so work screen uh, it's a self-test system it's con it's uh, it's compatible with social distancing the world we live in now and by using a self-test system, essentially you can test hearing whenever you need to, wherever you need to, 24 hours a day, which means that people who are perhaps temporarily on site can also be tested. Because like I said earlier, the last thing you want to do is bring uh, a further risk onto your site, which is someone who you don't know what their hearing ability is like. And the, the rather unfortunate thing about hearing is that people are notoriously poor at judging their own ability to hear. I suspect we've all got grandparents who can say that they can hear very well when they can't. So just begin to wrap up there. Teleology looks something like this. This is the work screen system. It's a simple tablet interface. It connects to the test. There's a couple of questions. You pop the earphones on, the headset on. It's ready to go wherever you are, anytime, anywhere. It can be battery operated as long as there is some degree of Wi-Fi signal. We can tether it to a mobile phone. Uh, and it's safe, there's no con uh, no contract, no contact even, um, and it's flexible with instant reporting, so you can be up and ready whenever you need to. So there you go, essentially all we need to say here is consider your hearing. I know it's probably not things that you've necessarily thought about before, but there is the propensity here for all the or the potential for instant and permanent damage to your hearing and indeed your long-term health. Remember, please, there is the link between your ears and the balance and, and, and sense of balance. And, and you all know this far better than me, what this might mean. Earmuffs are not enough. If you are wearing earmuffs and you require people to wear earmuffs, it is more than likely that you need to apply some degree of hearing silence there. And this is where work screen comes in. And then we go into adding this as part of your SSIP we work with uh, SMAS and Trish, uh, and we can make it easier uh, and, and more cost effective for you. But, uh, you know, I have my soapbox on this, and it is really important. And I've been really interested to uh, to look at working at height and the hearing in the context of working at height. So, again, thank you, like, uh, like the rest of your presenters. I hope you've heard me okay, but thank you for that. Great. Thank you very much, Tom. It was really, really interesting. Um, and you know, a subject really close to my heart. Um, we're going to introduce our last speaker, Lucy Cryer. She works closely with partner members of Safety Culture, including SMAS WorkSafe and the Scaffolding Association. Great, thank you very to much. To help Wayne. their members to use the adaptive mobile first technology to enhance operations and foster high performing, safer workplaces. Their flagship products, our Auditor and Ed app, enable teams to perform checks, to train staff, report issues, capture data, and communicate fluidly. Here's Lucy to tell us more about it. Great, thanks Trish, um, and hi everyone. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you for having us here today. It's a pleasure to be on with you. Um, and as Trish has just introduced, my name is Lucy and I am the Partnership Client Executive at Safety Culture. So I'm gonna talk to you in a little bit of detail about how we at Safety Culture tackle the problem of working at heights and how the two softwares that Trish has just mentioned can be deployed to ensure that everyone is safe while doing so. So first of all, we recognize that safety is everyone's responsibility and kind of tying in with what, what the other presenters today have said, it's the employer's responsibility to provide the right tools, training um, and safe methods to ensure and support the workforce. And it's the employer's responsibility to put this into practice. 
So we have a host of customers in the construction space. Um, and in prep preparing for this webinar, I kind of looked at our customers to see where actually is the risk when, when working at height and how does this manifest? So I identified four key ways, and this is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. There's a lot of other risks that are involved. But first of all, risk can arise when working from height from having incorrect equipment, simply just not having the right tools to do the job on, and things go amiss and problems arise from that. Secondly, and it's been mentioned a few times, a lack of training and a lack of knowledge around what best practices are and therefore standards slip. Thirdly, poor site or equipment maintenance. If you potentially have irregular or insufficient checks of the equipment that's used while working at heights, things can go amiss again and accidents and problems can arise from this. And finally, having insufficient protection. And this encompasses a lot of things, but not having the right PPE or the right risk assessments or the right processes in place to work from height effectively. So kind of following from that then, I um, look to consider, well, how can these risks be reduced and what can be done to reduce these risks when working from heights? And again, there's five key areas here, and I'm gonna link into how we at Safety Culture can help you to reduce these risks. So firstly, risk can be reduced by making sure your workers know that safety is their responsibility um, and having a transparent process around this. So making it clear for management so they can see exactly what's been done, where it's been done and by who, and for staff so they are fully on top of what they need to do, when they need to do it, and, and what the rules are around that. Secondly, you can create a culture of continuous learning. So training shouldn't be a box ticking one-off exercise where you sit and, and go through a PowerPoint, for example, and then it's completed and it's not refreshed. It should be something that's ongoing that's engaging and that's constantly updating in line with the changing legislations and things in the industry. Um, and one way that this can be achieved is through a mobile first training platform like as EDAP. So you can get training out to staff really easily and they can complete it from the phone within minutes. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a moment. Um, next, it you know, you can reduce the risk by making sure that everyone has all the information they need at their fingertips. So removing those gray areas, making everything visible and, and linking back to that first one, making everything transparent as well. Um, you can also ensure that nothing, no checks are ever missed. Um, so we, our second platform, iAuditor, really facilitates this because by doing your checklists and your risk assessments, and those paper forms on a digital platform, you can create schedules. You can assign these to people. People will get reminders of what needs to be done and when it needs to be done. Um, and it just, again, makes everything really clear on who's doing what and when they need to do it. And finally, um, you can make the, you know, the guys on the road or on site or on the ground, make them the first responders on the ground. So make give them the tools that allows them to be the eyes and ears, that if they spot a problem or they spot something that's not in line with the training that they expect, then they can create an action. They can assign this to somebody that something needs to be done about it and you can create a proactive, preemptive approach to managing the safety rather than reacting when, when an accident or something has gone wrong. So as I've kind of hinted upon, um, we at Safety Culture have two main platforms that facilitate these things to reduce your risks. And this is a very high level overview. There's a lot of other aspects to our tools, but the main ones that I think that are important for us to mention today to reduce the risk from working at height is this training piece, first of all. So we have an app called EDAP that, as I've mentioned, is a micro learning mobile first platform. So you can see from these two screenshots at the left here, I was completing a ladder safety course that's available on the public library for free. Within this course, it takes about five minutes to do and there's questions throughout. And you obviously get a, a grade at the end of that of how many questions you've got right or wrong. But deploying this as a company allows you to see exactly what training people have had, who knows what, 
and you can constantly add an update on this. Uh, you can create your own training courses really easily just by uploading a PowerPoint and the, the system will do it for you. And then you can add your own questions and gamification, true or false, uh, even things such as word searches throughout to test people's knowledge. So that closes that gap on, on people not knowing the best practice because they can really easily access it from their phone. And secondly, our second app, iAuditor. So this is a digital inspection platform that allows teams to click from their phone and access the inspection that they need. So again, you can see, you probably can't see the words on it, but I was completing a working at heights inspection that we've got available for free on our public library. But through using this, again, you can click on, answer all the questions, check that everything is in place that should be in place, and following from that, receive instant reporting where you can see how well that you've performed on that audit. Any failed items will be instantly flagged so they can be acted upon before the work takes place. And one really key thing that a lot of our customers find within construction um, with iAuditor is that you can add photos in the inspection. So you can add things as you go, photos of what's what's been erected and what's working and what's not. So it saves a lot of time. Um, but both of these things work together that everybody has the right working conditions to work safely from heights and to help you minimize that risk that's in place there. And ultimately to make sure that everyone can return home safe to their families at night. But if both of these platforms have a free option and you can go on our website and find some more information about this or even sign up and have a look for yourself for free and start using it. But if you have got any questions or would like any more information, I know that was a very whistle stop tour. Um, if you just up, take your camera up to the QR code, it will take you straight to my email address. So you can drop me an email directly and we can arrange a time to talk in more detail. But yeah, thank you all very much for listening. Super, thank you very much, Lucy. Um, there's just so much more to the um, iAuditor and Ed App applications. Um, so it would definitely be worth your while to contact Lucy um, for further information. We're going to go to our question and answer mode. Um, and all right, let me just show a question list. I'll get that up in a moment. Bear with me, please. <laughs> right, so the questions don't seem to be coming up there. What we can do is I will just read them off the platform here. And Rob, I think you need to be on standby because it seemed to be... Um, focus more on on your side so let me just pull this down all right so the first question that we have from terence wiggett is we've been asked to work off a trestle scaffold with a handrail addition which uses a single scaffold board as a handrail. Does this meet the working at height requirements? Um, the, the, the handrail, um, trestles are funny things because they're, 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 are they a scaffold or are they a work platform? They are a work platform, but, but what are the requirements for that? So what standards should they meet? So there's a little bit of uh, gray area there. The work at height range is very clear in schedule two it very clearly says that the height the handrail should be at so if you've just got one scaffold board then they won't meet that requirement because you need to have a board that will reach 950 and an, and a gap between an intermediate rail that will be no more than 470 so that's what you require the requirements for um trestles and for those handrails uh, the issue there is would they stop the person falling off the side? So there are a lot of tests for handrails under different components, but trestles fall outside of a lot of the, the, the standard structures, depending on what they're made of. Uh, so it, it, there's a little bit of a gray area there with, with, with that, because I don't know whether it's just one scaffold handrail or there are two. But 
on all work platforms you should have two uh, handrails one at 950 and no more a gap of no more than 470 to an intermediate handrail but if you look at set, schedule two of the work at height regulations it's very clear about that thank, thank you rob another one for you seven day inspections is it the scaffold director or the client um or people need i need you to clarify right first i know the answer but loads of companies do not yeah um the seven day inspection is is a statutory requirement or uh if we have inclement weather or the structure's been hit by something so the, the seven days but but actually the seven day is, is a bit of a, a, a funny statement because when you read the regulations it says in the previous seven days which means there's actually eight days uh, because we've got a lot of people who have created software where the inspection was running out to, so if you did it at 12 o'clock today it would run out at 12 o'clock in a week's time while well, finishing that extension and then it went to a traffic light and people wouldn't go over it there was no requirement for seven days at 24 hours. The, the guidance, the, the, the regulation is very clear, the previous seven days. So you would all have all of that day eight to inspect it. So that's the first thing. Who inspects it is a contractual issue. Uh, the CDM regulations are very clear that it would be the principal contractor who would be responsible for the inspection of the scaffold. And it would be up to that principal contractor to even either include it in the contract for the scaffold contractor or to use somebody who was external if it's a domestic client it's a different proposition because with you may not have um, a principal contractor and if you haven't got a principal contractor and you are the construction professionals then it's your equipment and therefore you would need to make sure it was safe uh, so that, 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 that there is a little bit in there but Basically, the principal contractor must determine whether they're going to inspect it or whether they're going to issue a contract to the scaffold contractor to inspect it every seven days. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Richardson has the next question and he writes, I have a scaffolding as a permanent fixture up to the top of a silo. With this being a permanent fixture, does the still require a seven day inspection or only when it is used um permanent structures and temporary structures are a, are a really difficult scenario because if it's a um if you're using it as a permanent structure then you need a engineer to prove that it meets all the requirements of a permanent staircase or whatever else it is that you're doing if it's a temporary structure um so if, if it's a scaffold that's erected, it will need inspecting if it's used for undertaking access to or undertaking work at height off of that structure. So um, it, when it, it, we have a lot of this with, with scaffolds that are up for a very long time. Um, when does it become a permanent structure? Well, the rules and regulations over something being designed as a permanent structure are quite different to those of a temporary structure. So you need clarification off an engineer, really, to determine um, when you should be doing it. Um, but if, if it's classed as a scaffold and a temporary structure, then the regulations would be clear that before anybody could access it, then it should be inspected before use. So that would be by the operative or every seven days. But obviously, if you're only going up that silo once a month, then if you've got the guy who's going up there trained to inspect it, then he can inspect it before he uses it. So you have to be pragmatic about these things. Um, and there are always solutions, but uh, the permanent structure, temporary structure needs to be clarified because there are different regulations. Thank you. Uh, Roland Ash um, says, he's a health and safety advisor within the scaffolding industry. Um, and has been for 50 years or more. One of the biggest bugbear is scaffold companies working both in the highway and footpaths without any safety precautions, um, advanced warnings or RSWA. 
Yeah, um, unfortunately, this is the biggest problem. Um, you know, our aim is to raise the levels of professionalism within the industry. And unfortunately, some of the best scaffold companies in the world work in areas where you'll never see them. Uh, nuclear, offshore, everywhere like that. Unfortunately, the cheapest sector of the market is the one that's most visible, which is domestic properties and, and the high street. And that's just unfortunate that the, the way that the industry uh, looks at that. Uh, we are doing some work. I, I do sit on the Highway Safety Officers Group Health and Safety Committee, and we are looking at how pavement licenses are issued and what checks need to be in. But until there is something legislative, the, um, the unfortunately, domestic customers and a lot of um, small shop owners and people like that will go for the cheapest cost option and will not know what good looks like. So unfortunately, Roland, you know, there's no short term answer to that unless we can sort out the issue that we've got with local authorities issuing pavement licenses. And that's always bearing in mind that the, 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 the company that have erected it and probably won't put their name to it, probably haven't even applied for a license. So, you know, unfortunately, that, that's, that's the end of the market that it's the hardest to influence, but we are working on it. Okay. Roland asks as well, um, if the CITB, still are still the governing body on checks for scaffolding cards um no this the all the citb do now is have the touchscreen test so when you look at a uh, a card the card scheme owners for the uk is cscs um and cscs endorse their hologram on some card scheme partners and for scaffolding that's that's cisrs um, who um, at this present moment in time are, are, are struggling to get cards, renew cards and training because of COVID and other bits and pieces. So it, it isn't the CITB that does that anymore. The only, uh, on all the CSCS cards, there is a CITB hologram to say that you've passed the touchscreen test. But the cards are, uh, at this present moment, the CITB closed down their card um, section and it's now, I think it's now being done by um, an external company. Okay, well, that concludes our questions. Um, thank you very much for attending our webinar. If you would like to recap on any of the slides, we will send you a link on Monday so that you can download your own copy of the presentation. If you have any other questions, please get in touch at Trish Mayer at smazltd.com. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending and also to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Trish, is, is Tom still there? Um, yes, he looks to be. I'm just going to stop.